Thanks very much, Dan, and also thank you, Jonathan, for including uh, me in the program, and welcome to uh, all the alumni who are back here. It's really good to see so many old friends again. So um, this is actually an extension of what Mike and uh, James were just talking about. We're going to talk about pet imaging for metastatic disease, and the reason I put metastatic in quotes here is because uh, many of these uh, techniques and technologies are really challenging how we traditionally define metastatic disease, which would be probably through bone scan and transaxial imaging, such as uh, MR or CT. Just as a start, I'm going to show a patient that uh, Jonathan and I share. This gentleman is 63, PSA is 7, Gleason 4 plus 5 disease, a biopsy, 13 out of 16 positive cores. MRI shows bi bilateral disease, extra caps or extension, seminal vesicle involvement, no metastatic disease on the MRI of the uh, prostate and pelvis. Looks pretty clean on a bone scan. There's some uptake that, that you can see in the left iliac area, but that on uh, CT showed no sclerosis. And the patient was felt to have non-metastatic disease. Here's this PSMA imaging. This is uh, an F18 radio-labeled uh, small molecule that targets PSMA called PYL. And you can see he's got really quite extensive metastatic disease on the PYL scan. These are primarily localized in, in bone, as you can see on the axial images. And so that raises the question, does this patient have what we would term as metastatic disease? Clearly, the bone scan is clear. PYL scan, definitely not clear. Um, so that raises the question of what is metastatic disease. And now we really think of oligometastatic disease as a potential subset of metastatic disease that potentially could be curable, or if not curable, then perhaps at least we could deliver enough focal or local therapy to be able to uh, put off systemic therapy for a prolonged period of time. So by the same token, let's look at this patient that uh, James and I share, PSA of 17 pretreatment, Gleason 4 plus 4 tumor, three cores positive on the left at surgery as T3A disease, six nodes at, on the left. Bone scan is entirely clear. So one might presume that this patient, for now at least, is free of disease, but on his pretreatment PYL scan, you can see this small dot at L1 right over there where the arrow is. He also has a, a, a positive finding in the right acetabulum. Here's that L1 lesion. We biopsy this. It is positive. Uh, and so he, too, by standard imaging, would have non-metastatic non disease, or at least local regional disease, as we know from the pathology. And so these cases illustrate the dilemma that we're in now in terms of how we're going to term these patients and treat these patients. They both have uh, clean scans by standard imaging beforehand, but for patient one, he clearly has widely metastatic disease by PSMA imaging. So should we abandon surgery? And should we deliver early systemic therapy? And if we're going to deliver early systemic therapy, should we consider him per latitude and charted as having extensive disease? and give him upfront chemotherapy or abiraterone with his ADT. For patient number two, who has oligometastatic disease, because all of his local regional disease is now out, should we irradiate these few bony residual sites? Should we give him early systemic therapy? What's the treatment paradigm that we should follow in these patients whose disease is only detectable on a systemic basis by virtue of novel imaging techniques that heretofore we didn't have? So let's talk about these techniques just as an overview for just a moment so we know what exactly we're talking about. These are just some of the PET uh, techniques that are available now for imaging patients. There's FDG PET, which of course is FDA approved and reimbursable, but only reimbursable for the assessment of castration-resistant metastatic disease, not for disease detection at diagnosis or staging. There's C11 choline, which is FDA approved. Uh, and which is available pretty much at a, only a select few centers in the United States, uh, Mayo Clinic here at MSK, and maybe one or, other, or two other sites. And then there's, there's fusiclovine or axiomin or FACBC, and that is FDA approved for the detection of disease after primary therapy. It's been FDA approved since last spring and is commercially available uh, throughout, so uh, throughout the U.S. That leaves us with two PSMA-directed imaging studies, which in the US are investigational only, but which are widely available if you just get on a plane and fly to Germany, 
other European countries, Latin American countries. And so many of us are seeing these patients, bringing these scans in. It's very frustrating for us all not to be able to order these on a routine basis here in the US. And then finally, that's, there's fluorinated DHT. That's available uh, now globally in the US, here in at WashU, in Europe at the Royal Marsden and in Amsterdam, and in Australia at Austin Health and Monash. And that's fluorinated dihydrotestosterone and targets the uh, AR, also completely investigational at this time. So we can, we're, I'm going to show you now that your disease burden or the detection of metastatic disease or being labeled as metastatic varies really by the selection of your detection instrument. But of course, what instruments we have available to us are very variable, certainly available by geography. Whether you live in Europe or the US is going to determine whether you have metastatic disease or not, and by your insurance plan. So let's look at FACBC. It's commercially available across centers in the US and FDA approved. But as you can see, this is right off the, uh, the website from Axiomen. Medicare national coverage has determined that the local Medicare administrative contractors may cover oncological prep procedures at their own discretion. So where you live and what you're insured, and even under the Medicare system, matters in terms of whether you're found to have early metastatic disease or not. In the private world, and this is just taken right off of a private insurer's website just a few days ago, it says Aetna considers fluciclovine experimental and investigational, and C11 choline experimental and investigational. And yet it is FDA, or both of these are FDA approved studies, but they've decided, you know what, we'll, we'll just consider this experimental. So depending on your insurance and your ge geography will determine as to whether you are found to have metastatic disease or not. Um, now there's quite a bit of variability in terms of performance, although the data comparing these uh, instruments is inadequate, and there's variability by the expression patterns on the target, that is the biology of the disease as well, and I'll just walk through these briefly here. So let's take C11 choline for a moment. Choline is the first uh, molecular imaging agent appro approved for uh, prostate cancer in the non-prostacent age, the contemporary age, that is. Um, and you can see that about, there's about a 50% detection rate after the PSA is 1.5 to 2 or higher. This means basically after the maximal window of, salvage, of curability for salvage radiation. So it's not optimal in that sense. That is, when you most want this imaging study to detect early metastatic disease is at the point where you, your best opportunity for the decision making in terms of disease eradication for salvage RT is behind you. You can see that there are other factors here that play into detection of disease, not just PSA level, but whether this is your first biochemical failure or not, your original surgical staging, and your Gleason score as well. But I think as a good benchmark, just keep this graph in mind, and let's compare it with uh, fusiclovine. You can see with that when you compare fusiclovine and choline head to head, there may be better performance characteristics at the low PSA ranges with fusiclovine or FACBC than with choline. Um, but again, your, high, your, your optimal dis detection is in the 1.5 to 2 uh, range of PSA. That brings us to PSMA-based imaging. PSMA, I've put a little uh, cartoon of the molecule up in the upper right here. It's a transmembrane. Uh, protein that um, has been extensively studied for both therapy and for, uh, and for imaging over a long period of time. The newer agents that we're talking about now, these are these urea-based uh, agents that are quite similar to each other. This is PSMA11, which is the basis of the gallium-68 radio-labeled uh, imaging agent, extensively used in Europe and tested in Europe. And this over here is the DCF-PYL study. This is a fluorinated compound developed by Mar Marty Pomper at uh, Hopkins. And it's the successor to his previous molecule, the DCF-BC molecule, which was studied at Hopkins and at NCI as well. So you have several molecules now that are small molecules, very short half-lives. They, they are eliminated from the blood pool quite quickly. They give nice, good images of tumor-to-background ratios. Um, and unlike 
fusiclovine and C11 choline, these do detect uh, disease at very low PSA values. You can see that in this study of uh, 248 patients, there is about 60% detection of disease with a PSA of between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. The similar res results were found in another study of 319 patients, again showing about 50% detection at very low PSA levels. And if you compare head-to-head -head F18 uh, choline and gallium-68 PSMA imaging, you can see that the patients who got the choline scan, all of these lesions in the dark orange were picked up by both scans, but there was about a 15% increment in the amount of disease detected even at very low PSA levels using PSMA-based imaging relative to the, the uh, F18 choline imaging. So it does look like that our lead candidate right now, globally speaking, is PSMA-based imaging, whether that's F18 or gallium-68 is somewhat controversial if you dwell in this world, but I think for the most of us here in the U.S., anything would be better than nothing. I mean, truly in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, and we are blind right now in terms of early detection of metastatic disease in the U.S. relative to uh, other countries. I'm gonna switch now from early detection of metastatic disease to metastatic CRPC, because there, PET imaging has quite a different role than just d disease detection. Let's presume now that we're talking about patients who have outright metastatic disease and are now on treatment for CR, C, C, uh, metastatic CRPC. So let's go to this patient. He was diagnosed originally in 1996. He got traditional treatment with combined androgen blockade initially with Castex, Nylandron uh, in combination with Eligard. Then he developed castration-resistant disease that was non-metastatic got treated for two years on apalutamide on the uh, Spartan trial and finally developed metastatic CRPC and was placed on abiraterone. Now this patient has a long and extensive uh, treatment history. So if we look at him, he has this extensive rib lesion over here on the left, this uh, scapular lesion uh, over here on the right. Here's that left-sided rib lesion on a PSMA-directed scan. This is a, another PYL scan, not really very much uptake at all there. And indeed, if you look at the axial imaging, just a blush of tra tracer. This is not really detected on the PSMA scan. And yet, on a plain old, decades uh, te old technology like a bone scan, it's there as plain as day. On the other hand, when you look at his CT, he's got this fine ground glass opacity on his CT. And you can see on the PYL scan, uh, it's right there in the, in the middle of his chest on the left hand side, on the right hand side. There it is, an axial, and we biopsied this. The rib lesion is definitely prostate cancer, only it does not express PSMA. And the lung lesion, which is just a blush on the CT, is PSMA avid and is also prostate cancer. So this shows you that with really advanced disease, PSMA imaging may not be everything that you would hope that it would be because of the diversity and heterogeneity of PSMA expression in the advanced patient. Let's look at another example of this. This was data that was presented by Mike Hoffman at ESMO a couple of uh, weeks ago. And in, this, is, this is based on his therapeutic trial of lutetium radiolabeled PSMA. And in addition to PSMA imaging, he did just plain old FDG PET scans on all of these patients. So if you see, look at this patient who has this big uh, substernal mass that's clearly evident on an FDG PET, uh, which is here, you can see that it's essentially invisible on the PSMA PET. Um, and it, unless you think that this is a unique case, uh, of the 43 patients that went into this trial, 13 of these patients were taken off study, a handful for low uh, counts and poor performance status, but the others were taken off because they didn't have consistent PSMA imaging, PSMA avid disease. And so again, when we're talking about PSMA imaging, about being our savior, we have to think about where in the natural history of the disease we're actually imaging these patients and using the, this agent. Because again, in advanced disease, you may not see uh, the totality of the patient's disease. Uh, just to reinforce that, this is um, from a clinical trial that we performed using PSMA-based imaging and PSMA-based uh, chemotherapy uh, conjugate. 
These are the circulating tumor cells from those patients. So all of these patients except for one have PSMA avid disease on imaging. But if you'll notice, only 40% of these patients have PSMA uh, expressing circulating tumor cells. And even those patients who have circulating tumor cells and have PSMA expression, for example, patient four, patient seven, patient nine, patient 11, patient 14, it's actually a tiny fraction of their circulating tumor cell component. So I think that the bottom line he here is that PSMA expression is far more heterogeneous in advanced disease than we've heretofore assumed. Remember that we always have said it means PSMA is ubiquitously expressed, it's an ideal imaging and therapy target. I think that the data that we're generating now with the imaging and the liquid assays would suggest that we have to be much more sophisticated about how we think about these patients, how we think about these therapies, and the reliability of these technologies. On the other hand, imaging may be very useful in these patients to select therapy, right? It's you, you take the picture, you make a decision about what you, based on what you see as to what therapy they should get, and test that hypothesis in clinical trials. By the same token, that heterogeneity can be very useful and important using other traces. This is an experiment that uh, Steve Larson and I conducted over the course of many, many years looking at fluorinated dihydrotestosterone to query androgen receptor expression and uh, FDG imaging. And you can see when you look at overall survival, those patients who have concordant FDG and FDHT uptake have a pretty good prognosis relative to those who only take up FDA, FDG and don't have FDHT avid disease. Now, they may not have AR driven disease, or they may have AR driven disease that's simply driven by ARV7, and so there's no ligand binding domain. But either way, when you look at the blend of, uh, of biology in these patients, even within these patients, you can prognosticate on these patients using a cocktail of uh, molecular imaging to stratify them by overall survival. We thought that perhaps this is just too limited a view in terms of a prognostic in indicator, looking at one PET scan versus another. So on the right, we modeled this out, the PET scans versus the usual prognostic indicators in prostate cancer, that is hemoglobin, LDH, albumin, Gleason score, alphas, et cetera and on multivariate modeling, what was most important in prognostication? PET imaging and LDH. So it's actually, you know, it, there probably is some real prognostic value in terms of querying the heterogeneity of advanced metastatic CRPC and using these models to risk stratify patients. So to conclude, yes, we can identify disease ever earlier than, ever, than before using these new techniques. Metastatic disease, as it's defined now, is destined to change based on these new imaging techniques, which right now would qualify someone as metastatic uh, on the basis as, uh, of sort of which uh, tracer was ordered, what tracer was available, what part of the world that they live in, and who their insurance company is. And that's not a good place for us to be as a field. My second point is that we're going to see real Will Rogers effects here. The patients who are now metastatic are going to have a more favorable prognosis as we move those patients who were presumed to be locally high-risk disease into the metastatic category who otherwise would have been non-metastatic. And the patients with locally advanced disease, their prognosis will improve because we're going to take out all those early metastatic disease patients that we can't see right now. So we need to be really careful when we report data as to which imaging techniques were used to stage these patients. And then finally, advanced disease is heterogeneous. Um, we can use these molecular imaging techniques for treatment selection, prognostication, and other uses. Uh, and it's just a question of getting those trials well designed, incorporating to therapeutic studies, and done. Thanks very much. And thanks to the whole group.